Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to this session and to the last day and the last morning of this uh, online consultation. Thank you very much for being here. Today's session is focusing on the working group one, which is capacity building. And I see from the list that some of you are awake in the middle of the night. So uh, thank you for your dedication also. Um, today I'm going to go through the objectives and some logistics. If you've heard this once, twice, maybe three, four times, maybe five already, please bear with us. Um, and uh, then I will be giving my uh, the, the mic uh, to Jihan Osman, who is the um, who is our chair for capacity building, where unfortunately today our colleague Skander Genya has an engagement with his ministry, which he was not able to, um, and for this reason he was not able to be with us right now, but he will be following this and the results online and will be, uh, will be available if you have any questions also. So the objectives of this session, as all the other sessions, are the same. And I think as we get through it and we're getting more and more clear, it's to clarify the priority areas of action per working group. So the idea is to drill down into seeing what would be somewhere, some areas to start activities in terms of what has been identified by the Dynamic Coalition in its launch. So we've had three consultations to date. So we've had invited people to send in their inputs three. This is the third time since March. So March, April, May, June, July in five months that we have asked people to send their inputs on the actions of the Dynamic Coalition. And uh, during this time, the last uh, consultation we had is a survey and we it was open for 10 days and participants were invited to identify what they felt was the most were the most important areas of action within the areas that had already been identified and uh, we have sent you the results of this and the objective today is to drill down further to get a better idea of where it would be a good topic to focus the second objective is to identify user needs and parameters of an electronic tool for information about sharing information within and about the dynamic coalition activities. In this regard, we have asked this question in every single working group and we are consolidating the inputs that we have from each working group on this question. Now, the technical points uh, I need to outline, I've already outlined them. If you've been through a couple of these sessions, you know what it looks like, but basically there are, we're using Zoom, there is interpretation. You see the interpretation button. If you click on French, you will hear it in French. If you click on English, you'll hear it in English. If you click on disable, you will have it in the language that is being spoken. There will be no interpretation. The chat is not functioning for questions and answers because it's uh, we want to focus the discussion in the question and response question and answer box which looks like those two bubbles the, th the ones I have in yellow here and we uh, we want to um, we would like you to put your questions and comments or most and links if you want to share something in this box we will read what you say out loud so that it will be interpreted into the other language. If you want to take the floor, please raise your hand and we will open the mic and we'll give you the floor. So with that, I give the floor to Jihan uh, Osman, who is the, our chair for uh, capacity building. And Jihan, the mic's yours. Uh, thank you, Zainab. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you for those who are upsetting their midnight sleep to be with us. Uh, on behalf of Skander, uh, I would like to apologize for him not coming, but we've been working together over the past few days in preparing for this. Um, this is a very big, big day in Tunisia, the day of uh, when they disclose uh, the high school diploma um grades and so it's a very uh, critical day for the ministry of education in, in which uh, dr skander works um so today we'll be talking about uh, work group one capacity building and um 
uh, there is a lot of interest in capacity building for OER. We, we saw that from the survey results. If we look at uh, slide three, um, we'll be noticing that several items are high on the next slide, please. Uh, that there are several items that are high on the priority list. Um, and um, from looking at the detailed results of everything, there seems to be um, um, a general attitude that uh, let's really look at what we have before we start moving forward. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on collaboration, collaboration in terms of uh, building and sifting through uh, materials that we already have, including for capacity building specifically, but also OERs. Let's go through what we have and before we move forward, identify the gaps. There is also a lot of emphasis on uh, research and knowledge creation that it's time to share um, things like best practices, to come up with models that uh, work better and to localize and contextualize these models. There is a lot of emphasis on uh, collaborative research. Um, and, and so we'll go through, through all of these items one by one. Um, so these seems seem to be the general trends, the general concerns, the general needs, uh, a need to focus on what we already have before we move forward, a need to collaborate, localize, and the need to share the best practices and models that uh, we already um, um, have right now. Uh, uh, during the, um, the survey, there were a lot of different sites shared and we'll be sifting through them, not right now, but uh, later on. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there seems to be a lot of material that already exists throughout there that we can make use of. Uh, I will now move on to slide number six, which is the first item. Um, the one, uh, please move next. Next. Um, existing capacity building materials. As I've mentioned, there is a strong emphasis uh, and acknowledgement that we already have a lot of um, distinct projects and existing building uh, capacity building materials that are around the world, but um, that uh, somehow um, we are might be reinventing the wheel by not collaborating together and synthesizing what we have um, um, before we move forward. And so um, this is a very important item. So number one, we have identify generic, specific, locally uh, contextualized OER content. Um, and, um, and this identifies mainly three objectives, like what generically do we have that can work across different localities, what is specific to particular groups and, and what is locally contextualized, thereby also um, like uh, tapping on the points of um, uh, inclusiveness that we talked about over the past few days. So um, just starting with this point, are there any comments or questions or clarifications um, that we need to make here be before we move forward? Okay, so um, I'm monitoring the participant list. If anyone would like to make inputs at this stage, please do raise your hands and I'll open up the microphones for you to be able to speak. Uh, alternatively, if you prefer to put uh, a response into the Q&A, um, I will read that out. Right, I have two hands, oh, I have various hands coming up. Uh, I'm going to start with a voice we haven't heard yet, um, I think. So we have Wayne McIntosh. Um, Wayne, you are open, so you should be able to talk now. 
Uh, hi, Neil. Um, thanks very much. I'm, I just want to confirm that you're hearing me. Yes, we are. Uh, thank you kindly. And um, it, it's wonderful to be able to participate here from New Zealand. It's getting late at night. But um, thank you for the opportunity to be, to be able to contribute. I, I think the focus on multilingualism is particularly important um, in terms of how we can create opportunities for uh, translating existing resources and capitalizing on open source infrastructures to be able to deliver open courses uh, in building capacity in OER. Um, I, I should uh, mention that we are collaborating with UNESCO. Um, Zainab and her colleagues are working on translating a French iteration of one of the open courses that was a, uh, open online courses that was originally funded by UNESCO. Um, next week, I'm working on a consultation with colleagues in India for a Hindi translation. Um, but it would be great if we could open up these initiatives for collaborative community translation efforts um, across multiple languages. So I just want to put that on the table that there are opportunities for us to be collaborating um, with each other on multilingual translation. So um, you know, an open invitation in this, the spirit of the OER movement. Um, yes, I mean, uh, thank you very much for this comment. I think, uh, I think part of uh, the question is that what, what already exists in languages that we're seeking, uh, but we're not aware of, um, so, um, but this idea of having a common hub where you can already um, uh, um, like um, discover what is already there um, is indeed very useful. We have personally at, uh, in Egypt made use of that, of the OER hub and used the materials of, of Kenya. Uh, that we adapted to our local context. Uh, we did have to translate it, but at least we had a good place to start. And, and that definitely helped us move uh, faster with our uh, project. We're trying now through this OER hub to, uh, which is, um, uh, which is uh, kind of sponsored by UNESCO, that we identify what exists there in a variety of languages. And so we can already see that there is a lot there. Um, and, and so the idea behind the, the, the spirit of this first um, uh, group of, uh, of comments is really uh, working together and seeing what, what we already have because there seems to be a lot, not just within uh, under the sponsorship of UNESCO, but many other organizations as well. So thank you for your comment and, and, and good luck with that uh, um, uh, promising initiative in, in New Zealand. Okay, we have uh, next on, on the list of raised hands, so it's better your uh, you're open to talk. Um, if you can maybe just introduce yourself and say where you're from as you get going. And it's the same to all people who will speak on this as well, please. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to join um, this coalition. It's wonderful. I'm calling from Kenya for a group called Learning for Humanity based in Canada. I was caught up in Kenya because of COVID. The airways were not like that, so I'm working from Kenya. Is there anything, uh, as I think about Hello? Um, yeah. You're, you're breaking up a bit, unfortunately. Yeah, you're breaking up, yes. Oh, now? Uh, let's try again. Otherwise, maybe you can type your comment and I'll read it out. Okay, let me, let's try again. Uh, I'm saying my name is Jagato, Dr. Gato. I work for Learning for Humanity based in Canada. Um, I'm in Kenya because I was I can't put a meeting after some of them did not and then um, COVID happened and I did not fly back. I'm afraid you're still breaking. Unfortunately, you're still okay. breaking up. Um, let me write it down. Let me write it down. Type you your comments in, in. I, I will I'll read them out. Thank you, I'll do that, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, 
So, so next we have a comment from Christopher Mayaki in the Q&A, uh, who says, good morning all and thanks for this opportunity. We have residual issues to do with capacity building in order to fulfill the urgent need for our already approved policy. We have an understanding with Gen Zenep for a workshop to take place. Um, we would be happy to escalate this and proceed with capacity building and sensitization. Congratulations to Gihan. Uh, Christopher also notes that he unfortunately wasn't able to join the policy session yesterday. Um, thank you for the update, Christopher. Uh, as you may have seen from the emails, fortunately, at least, even if you couldn't join the session, I'm sorry about that, but there's a recording online that, uh, the, 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 that is available. So next I'm going to move across to Cable Green. Um, Cable, you're open. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, just building on uh, what Wayne was saying, I think this is a, an incredible opportunity. There's just a very large amount of resources that are out there that as we are able to organize them for the purposes of helping governments understand and implement the OER recommendation, I think it's a, it's a fabulous opportunity. I wanted to highlight just very quickly, since you asked about different uh, languages, uh, two areas where Creative Commons can provide some assistance. Uh, the first is we have um, uh, a CC certificate program, which is a it's, a, it's an online course about learning details about open licensing, the commons, copyright, public domain, et cetera. Uh, all of that content is available as OER under CC by licenses, but specific to this question, uh, the content's currently available in English, Arabic, and Italian. Uh, we're working on uh, new translations now uh, in Bengali, Spanish, and Yoruba, and uh, we'll be translating into addi additional languages. Um, the content was just translated into um, a read over audio. We put it in book format. All of these works will be under a, a CC BY license, a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, second thing I would say just in general is that uh, Creative Commons, uh, to the extent that uh, materials about open licenses and public domain tools uh, may be useful uh, as resources, uh, we have, uh, as you can imagine, over 20 years, um, handouts, graphics, websites, FAQs, templates, et cetera, that we've created at Creative Commons, but mostly that others around the world have created amazing works and we tend to collect those. Uh, those are all also all openly licensed and available. And so as, as we get, as we dive even deeper and start and UNESCO starts to uh, help us get organized and call out for very specific works, uh, be them infographics or uh, works in various languages. Uh, we look forward to contributing to that uh, in in multiple languages. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cable, and um, this is um, this is a tremendous uh, success to to have this uh, important content in the varieties of modalities that you that you mentioned and the variety of languages. And um, I think this is something that uh, we notice a lot is that people even those who are aware of OERs. So we do know Creative Commons, some of us do, but the majority do not. So having these, these, um, these hubs where people know uh, that this is where I can find what I need. And I think this lack of awareness is something um, that, that we notice all the time when we work with teachers, uh, where, I mean, in Egypt, for example, is 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 missing those hubs where I can find the most important information or um, knowing where to go next. So OER um, for people who don't who are new to that that idea uh, is 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 overwhelming, and they don't know where to go to get trusted materials they don't know uh, and, and hence not only capacity building in them, uh, knowing how to create them and how to find them, but also how to navigate this, this new world and, and outlook. Um, that is something um, that is very important and that we increasingly feel um, needs, to, needs to happen. So I'm very glad that UNESCO is pushing for this organization and and us coming together and synthesizing what we have and, and kind of creating that 
that hub um, or those different hubs where uh, people can come and find information on, on OERs. Thank you. That, that's great. Uh, thank you. Um, as you might expect, Cable, uh, Wayne has, has asked, posed the question about whether or not the CC certificate course, uh, what the cost, cost to participate in the certificate, CC certificate course is. So maybe if you could just clarify that. Sure. So there's, uh, there's different options. What, what I was referring to is all of the content of the well, all the content, frankly, of everything that Creative Commons creates is uh, is licensed either under CC0, where we dedicate works directly to the public domain, or CC BY. Uh, e everything that we create around the certificate, the translations, et cetera, are all under a CC BY license, um, which, of course, means that anybody may take it, that content for free, do anything they want with it. Um, in fact, many uh, entities around the world have taken that content and rather than put together a 10 week class, like uh, that's one of the offerings that we provide, uh, but they've, uh, they've decided they wanted a two hour session or maybe a one day session. And so of course it's, it's openly licensed, it's all free to take and people are free to do with it what they like. Uh, I, what, what, what Wayne is referring to is we also have uh, an online uh, 10 week course that's facilitated uh, where we pay facilitators to, to run that. Um, there is a cost to take that course in that format facilitated and then to get a certificate at the end of it. Um, it we, we, there's, a, there's a fee for that. There's also scholarships that we provide to defer that fee. Um, but that's not specifically what I was talking about here. Merely that these resources are all available. They're under a CC by license and people may use them however they see fit. So, Cable, I have a question regarding the last point that you mentioned regarding the certificate. Is that certificate offered in uh, the 10-week course and the certificate, is that offered in multiple languages or only English? Um, and so that's my first question. And then I have a couple more questions about that. Uh, sure. So one of the, because the course is facilitated by, uh, by trained instructors, one of our goals is as, uh, as individuals take the, the certificate, we're, we're always looking for uh, graduates that actually speak languages other than English. And we inquire about whether or not they would like to be trained as instructors and then offer the course in languages other than English. And so what we have today are the languages that I, I laid out. Um, the Italian, but, Arabic, and Exactly. And, English. Okay. and so we're, um, we're, we currently have not offered them in those languages yet, but we do have instructors that are trained. So that's the next step. Uh, we also okay. have, uh, as I mentioned, we're moving into other languages. Um, it's, it's been an organic process as individuals have taken the certificate course and they've said, yes, I would like to work on it. And so we've had a, we had somebody recently from Nigeria who said, I would like to translate this into Yoruba and, and then start to teach it in that language. So that's great. Those are options. And, you know, as I pointed out before, there's nothing that stops uh, anybody. We've contributed all these resources to the commons. If somebody would like to translate them and, and teach them in different languages, that's great. We're, uh, we're all for that and we're happy to facilitate and support those processes. Uh, that's, that is excellent. Um, now, um, you kind of answered several other questions that I had. So something that often arises in, in Egypt and, and probably most of Arab countries is the idea of that if teachers are interested in that, they often want a certificate. A certificate that would be accepted by their um, um, by their um, ministries um, for promotion or licensure or whatever, depending on the country they belong to. But this is a very important um, point uh, for teachers in, 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 in the Arab region is that there is an acknowledged uh, certificate that is accepted uh, by their um, ministries towards um, points, licensure, whatever it is. Um, and, and so that is, uh, that is a huge barrier in our region uh, regarding existing materials. So for example, in Egypt, we have existing materials, but that have not been approved by the government yet. And so teachers are more hesitant 
to to partake in those capacity building um, uh, opportunities. So so that is one element that might be unique to our region, or maybe is is relevant to other regions as well. But um, what, some of the details that we found in the survey is this push for advocacy that we start talking to governments uh, and as we are synthesizing what we have that part of what we do is that we get the acknowledgement of, of ministries and governments of those materials and of those uh, capacity building opportunities um, so so that is uh, a point that i raise and i'm wondering whether other regions of the world would have similar concerns yeah, just a, a quick comment for me and then I should probably get off the mic and, and let others jump in. Um, I, I We've encountered that as well. Uh, some some people are happy just to get a certificate and I should I uh, would be remiss if I didn't point out C Creative Commons is not the only NGO that is uh, running professional development opportunities and providing certificates. Um, Wayne is on, OER University is, is running a course uh, doing this, which is great. Uh, the Open uh, Textbook Network, for, uh, now it's called the Open Education Network, they run a certificate, Spark runs a certificate program, um, uh, as do others. And so I think what's important for this conversation is that wherever possible, and it's, it's all those entities that I named are openly licensing their content, to your point about whether or not the credential that's offered is going to be accepted by governments or by formal education institutions. Um, I think, you know, in many cases, Creative Commons, for example, is we're not a degree granting institution. Um, our certificate doesn't mean much in an academic, uh, a formal academic system. Uh, and yet a formal academic system could take the OER that we're all producing around these professional development opportunities and use it and re reuse it, revise and remix it and put it into a format under the umbrella of an organization that actually does have authority for educators. Um, and I think that's a, that's a gift that all of the NGOs can and are providing uh, to the Commons so that we can make sure that not only is, uh, is awareness raised, that we're building capacity and expertise uh, with high quality materials in this space, but then the educators themselves are also able to uh, get the credential or the continuing education credits that they need. Okay, okay. Thank, thanks Cable. Um, we, we got just two comments in terms of translation of all of that, uh, which I won't, I don't think require a response, but just to observe. So Christopher Mayaki says, did I hear that you're translating in Yoruba? Uh, which I did, I think you did hear. That's a good development, but it might also be useful to, con in addition, to consider translating in Hausa language, which is the only language that is spoken by no less than 75 million people in the West African subregion, in Nigeria, Ghana, Chad, Niger, Benin, etc. I think as we heard there, Christopher, the Yoruba translation is being driven by someone who's actually um, volunteered to do the translation. So maybe if we can find a Hausa volunteer, um, we can get that process moving. Uh, so Spetha makes the same comment, except uh, does anyone know how much is happening with regard to resources in Kiswahili, spoken by over 150 million people in Africa? So I think, again, that's a very good point. Um, so Spetha, it would be really useful if we can find volunteers who might be willing to help with translation um, for both of those languages and others, of course. Um, I have two additional comments, one from Suspeta, which I'll read out now on, uh, on the generic issue. We, we should identify already existing resources and also realize that there are many more resources that are not documented and residing uh, in teachers, both current and retired. These resources can be aggregated, curated, developed, translated, and deployed for use globally. Means of getting these experts to participate in this initiative is also a means of building knowledge societies per subject and learning areas globally. I think that's a, an important point that we all agree with. Christian uh, Stracker makes the observation, which I think is connected. My key interest would be to develop free learning materials for teachers as well as learners how to use OER and how to create and publish OER. And he suggests, could we start collecting all existing learning, learning materials about such introductions for capacity building? 
think that is definitely something that we can do. Um, and uh, so just quickly back to the uh, issue of volunteers and translations. Um, Cable, we're hearing from Christopher that he could find House of Volunteers. So uh, maybe we can connect those up. Uh, and Rania Idris Mohammed also indicates that translation to Arabic in general is also needed. So, um, uh, let me oh, pause there. Go, on, comment. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Gihan. Uh, so I think, I think before we jump into translations, I mean, we should see if, if there is existing materials. So I kind of don't remember the exact details, but I did hear about materials in Swahili. And um, it was some, a discussion that I had at a conference with some colleagues um, and I did not, um, you know, kind of concentrate because Swahili is, is, is off my radar and Arabic is the thing that I talk more about. So, so uh, we are moving, um, uh, so our university, for example, is moving very fast in terms of providing more and more materials in Arabic. Uh, even though we are an English-only instruction university, but um, for most of our teachers in Egypt and in the Arab world, English is not the language to reach them. And so I'd be happy to talk with anybody who's interested in developing or curating more materials in Arabic. There's a lot out there. And as some of you mentioned, teachers have a lot to give in that area as well and have their materials. Uh, they just don't know how to share them um, in a way that they consider safe and that gives them um, um, uh, the recognition for it. So these are some areas that where teachers are also concerned, the safety of sharing and the recognition for it. So, um, so that is another area, like working with teachers to, to curate, but also to create content and, uh, and learners, of course. So I think these are some very important points. I'm wondering at this point whether we want to uh, move on to the next one, which is creating new materials, which kind of overlaps with what we talked about here. So Neil, are there any more comments before we move I have, forward? I have one raised hand from Fabio. Sure. So Fabio, if you okay. can introduce yourself and then uh, make your comment briefly before we move on. Yeah, quickly. I'm Fabio Nascimbeni from uh, the International University of La Rioja and the Open Education Policy Hub. And actually, uh, well, I would like to suggest a few courses. I, I will then put the links uh, in, the, in the chat. One is the Open Med course, uh, available in uh, English, French, and Arabic, developed, uh, co-developed by some uh, universities from uh, Europe uh, and uh, the South Med. I think it was Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, and Morocco. And that's for uh, university educators on the use of OER and OEP. And then one is uh, from a project called OER App, that's on use of OER for adult educators, so in the field of adult learning. And that's, uh, I think, available in uh, English, German, and Italian, if I remember well. And so this is, let's say, a few, a few ideas. And then uh, I think we should uh, flag somehow those courses that are First of all, still uh, updated because a number of courses, uh, as we know, are, are, have been developed a few years ago and might not be the most updated ones. And also the ones that have a community behind. So, for example, the, the Open Med course uh, is uh, living not only on its own, on the web in multiple formats and, and with open licenses, but is uh, also being used and supported by a community within the UNIMED network. Uh, it's a sub-network on e-learning and open education. So I think it's, it would be important to tag those courses that are up, not only updatable, but as all of them, but updated and which one have a sort of a community underneath so that uh, both for translation and for improvement, this could be the, I mean, it could be much, much easier. Uh, thank you, Fabio. These are some uh, excellent points. Um, so again, like from the few examples that you gave, it's, there seems to be a lot that already exists out there and that needs to be received through, uh, in terms of how updated they are, in terms of the communities they support them, and so on and uh, so forth. So thank you very much. Just one more comment, uh, one more hand, uh, Gihan, which I'll take quickly if sure. that's all right. Sure. 
This is uh, Javiera Atenas. Uh, I'll ask you, Javiera, to also just um, outline what you said in the Q&A. Then you don't have to listen to me reading it out. Um, yeah. You can go ahead now. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Javiera from the OE uh, Policy Hub too. And um, just to let you know that at the OER world map, because it's, we're, we're, we're part of, of the OER world map, uh, we have plenty of materials already that might need updates, that, uh, but also if someone wants to join and start working and helping us uh, doing, doing curation and curate particular collections, that will be great. Um, if you have courses, materials, guides, anything in any language that can help the community, please put them in the map because that might help communities, for example, the uh, Spanish-speaking community, if you map things in South America, they know where to get the same for Africa. So, um, if you have materials, it's easier that have them kind of centralized in the map because the map is open and free for everyone. So, and, and then if anyone wants to do research or wants to update or translate materials, they can just refer to one central point. So, yeah, that, that's our invitation for, for this community. So, so, uh, so regarding that map, so would that be open to anybody in the world to, to add things to the map or is that uh, restricted to certain parts of the world? No, 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 of course, it's open for everyone. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it's been open for quite a while. Uh, okay. We're working on it, uh, on, on trying to uh, spread the word, uh, but yeah, anyone can join. Uh, it can be also a student from a course that's been producing OER. Uh, any, everyone is welcome. And if they have any questions, they can contact me, Jan Neumann, Leo Habermann, or, or Fabiana Shimbeni. So it's, we, we, we are here to support uh, the, the development of capacity building across open education and open educational practices so, and policies too. So get in touch with us. So, Thank you. So that, yeah, that, uh, might, that sounds like a good place to start uh, maybe. It's curating just where we could find things. Uh, so thank you, Javiera. Oh, you're welcome. Just, uh, uh, there was a request from Christopher just to clarify, all of these suggestions will be recorded in the meeting notes. I think definitely, Gihan, we should move on now. If people have yes. more uh, links and so on, please do just put them in the Q&A. We'll capture them all, um, and then we'll take it from there. So. Uh, I'll advance the slides now, Gian, Sure, so we can sure. So the next point talks really about development of new capacity building materials. And I think we've covered a lot uh, in our first part about identifying where are some of the gaps. So we've identified gaps uh, uh, in terms of the languages available, in terms of knowing where to get them, in terms of updating materials, identifying communities, and uh, and getting um, uh, working on credentials. Uh, I'm wondering whether um, there are any other points that you'd like to uh, talk about in terms of uh, new building materials. There's in the comments we have, there is uh, an emphasis on, um, on localization and collaborative solutions. So, uh, Neil, do you have any questions or raised hands regarding point number two? Nothing coming through yet, but uh, let's get let's give it a couple of uh, sure a couple of options. We, we we're still getting a few comments um, related to existing materials, which I won't go back okay. to because, uh, as I said, okay. I'll just report all of those in the the record of the meeting. Um, yeah. So, so as I as I mentioned before, the general feel seems to be that we have a lot out there. Before we reinvent the wheel and create more materials, let's identify where are the gaps, where where are where are there communities or languages that are not addressed, where do we need localization, uh, rather than build more materials from scratch again, as if uh, there is not such a huge body and richness of materials available. So that has been the general spirit 
uh, or sense I got from, from the surveys and, and the comments we got. And I guess the, the wonderful thing about OERs is the potential, potential to localize and adapt um, materials to the local context. And, and that is one of the, the strongest additions to it. Um, so Neil, are there any um, Nothing Questions. specific on, on this at this stage. Um, I okay. think what this is suggesting to me is that in terms of, of steps, really we, we should start with, with that catalogue of existing resources yeah. and then yeah, have a map of, of the needs um, against which we could then uh, do a, a sort of audit or review of what exists compared to what we're looking for. And obviously, exactly. as we heard from Wayne earlier, we should integrate the, the issue of multilingualism into that to make sure that we're not just looking at language, uh, materials in one or two languages, but in a number of key languages uh, along the lines that have been suggested here. Um, Absolutely. And then we can take it from there. I do have one hand now. So uh, we have sure. Nokulanga and Glovu, who I happen to know is from University of the Bitwadisrand, just down the road from me. Um, so Nokulanga, I'm opening you up your mic now to be able to talk. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Neil and Tai Gihan. Uh, thank you for facilitating this um, session. Uh, what I wanted to say is I understand that you, we are saying let's uh, look at what we already have. But uh, in most cases, what we already have is not in a digital form. And therefore, I would recommend that we, we uh, capacitate young talent from universities, for instance, who are very good with um, uh, working with uh, uh, digital um, resources. And once we capacitate them, then they can take the responsibility of converting what we have uh, to digital form. Now, in my university, we actually have a course uh, for designing and developing materials. Uh, and what I've noticed is that these young students excel beyond imagination where developing materials is concerned, much as they might be developing new materials. But I'm thinking those are the students we can use later on as we collaborate to convert what uh, we have to uh, digital form. Thank you. Thank you, Nukolonga. I think this is a very important point and something that we also notice is not just the, de the degree of, of talent, but also uh, um, the enthusiasm that many of our students in, uh, who, who will be teachers um, exhibit towards, uh, towards creating materials that empower teachers in the future. So that is an excellent point and an important resource as, as we move ahead. So thank you for that. Um, so I think, Neil, if, uh, if there are no more questions, let's move to the next point, which was also very high, um, which is the, the point of collaboration. Um, so, um, so again here, the idea that we got is that there are a lot of organizations um, that are out there, um, whether they are universities, NGOs, uh, and so, or individuals that, that, that work in the area of open education and OERs, um, but um, they do not, um, to, to varying degrees, they do not collaborate or work enough together, uh, which in a, in a sense diminishes the impact uh, they could have. And so there is a lot, the, the prioritization given to collaboration across institutions, across countries, across different stakeholders has been a very important and prominent uh, point in the results of this survey. Um, and so, um, so here in the comments we have, you know, we have collaboration to contextualize, co collaborations by region, collaboration by language uh, and across languages. Um, there was also uh, some of the comments we had was like um, 
when will people in OER st wor start working more not only with governments but also with teacher organizations. So there, there seems to be the comment that um, organizations work a lot with universities but work much less with, um, with organizations that directly deal with um, in-service teachers like um, teacher training centers in, in countries and, um, and as Nkulunga mentioned, um, uh, like um, centers that produce materials for teachers and that there should be a lot more collaboration with entities like that. Um, and so, so there are different kinds of ideas for collaboration, but again, it's the same idea of synthesizing our efforts in a sense, rather than working uh, in silos. Um, and I now um, um, am open to questions and comments that would help us dig deeper through these points. Thank you, Gihan. I just just quick update on a few of the issues coming through the Q and A. Um, Fauzi Barud has mentioned uh, that OER Lebanon is devoted to raising awareness and promoting use of OER in Lebanon and the MENA region in Arabic and English. Um, we've also had an input from Marcela Morales uh, saying we OE Global invite the Spanish commu speaking community, sorry, Spanish speaking community to join our OE LATAM regional network node. Uh, there's a URL there created with the purpose of promoting and fostering collaboration. Um, adding not only current resources, but creating new ones that address localized needs of the region in content and language. So we are getting um, quite, a, quite a lot of inputs on additional locations where this is all happening. Um, again, we'll record all of that in the notes. I'll, I'll then read out uh, an input from Igor Lesko about supporting collaboration. Uh, he's also from OE Global. Um, so I think that this is really important. To provide an example, many governmental or institutional OER slash open education policy advancements, advancements in different countries can be attributed to the work of individual champions or national open education coalitions. Examples can be found in countries like Canada, NL, I assume is the Netherlands, uh, Poland, Slovakia, US, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia and others. However, advancements made in this regard could be reversed if individual champions or national networks lack adequate support or resources. I think that the same can be said about champions and practitioners who are trying to advance open education in their respective institutions or countries. There are examples of support structures in different parts of or across the world that serve as forums for networking, sharing of best practices, capacity building activities, collaborations across different languages and so on. And uh, he goes on to give some examples. Um, the the LATAM initiative that I've just mentioned is one Creative Commons uh, network, Community College Consortium for OER in the US and a couple of others. So questions he has for consideration, maybe with, for inputs from others. How can we support the work of existing champions or national networks in different countries who often feel isolated and or lack adequate support or resources? How can we help identify, create, and then support local champions and networks in different countries to advance open education? Perhaps there is an opportunity here to connect this initiative with national commissions for UNESCO to strengthen efforts in different countries. So there's a question there that people might like to answer. Uh, the, I think the idea of connecting to national commissions for UNESCO is also an interesting one. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Igor, I then have a comment from Robert Schuer. Shuva, so excuse me, bad pronunciation. My experience is that organizing this around knowledge fields, for example, nursing, is really working because then you can connect awareness for OER to the specific needs of that community. So Robert's suggestion there is that uh, we should look at those knowledge fields being organized by some kind of, uh, uh, or the, co the collaboration organized by knowledge fields uh, is a good idea. So thank you, we'll incorporate that. Um, Zeynep, over to you. Uh... Merci beaucoup. C'est uh, Zeynep Bouglou de l'UNESCO. Je... Thank you very much. This is Ney Zeynep for UNESCO. I'll speak English. We're from UNESCO. Uh, I would like to respond to the question of Igor Lesko. 
at least one of his points. Um, the point concerning the point concerning the national commissions commissions. Um, and one, I think, the dynamic OER coalition is the way to have a link to the national commissions. Uh, the UNESCO National Commissions, and we have uh, we have worked on this. Uh, this is one of the objectives of the OER National Commission. So I think it will be very important that we include uh, Gasper in the follow-up. But that is one of the missions of the OER Dynamic Coalition. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Zainab. Uh, I'd like to comment on uh, the two. Um, uh, previous comments. So I think I, I agree. I forgot the name. I'm sorry. I think it was Igor um, about the support. So the question would be indeed, this is an issue. Indeed, people who work with these, especially in, in parts of the world where OER and the idea of open education is new, that they need support. The question would be what kind of support would be most uh, impactful? in uh, sustaining um, their efforts uh, and in expanding uh, the network of people um, working in that. So, so that is a question that I would uh, uh, agree with that, the idea of um, what, what kind of support would be most impactful and make a difference. And is that a matter that uh, would be different from one locality to the other, depending on which country we're working in and with. Um, so, so that might be very important. Um, um, in, in, many parts of, uh, in many parts of the country where education is also centralized, um, working with governments through official, official um, uh, avenues is, is extremely important. Uh, and um, it, it, it is a, an important part of form of support, but it's not easily obtained. And so how can we do that? The dynamic coalition is definitely a wonderful place to start, but what else can we do? Um, the other point uh, is, is definitely the other point that I think Robert made regarding that uh, uh, knowledge domains. Uh, that is, is, is definitely important, especially with skeptics. And as you were saying that, um, the, the imp that, that nurses want to hear from nurses and want to work with nurses or nursing professionals and uh, engineering and whatever. And so it really depends on the knowledge domain. Uh, but also that we might want to consider working with organizations that, that, that are working in that domain in respective parts of the world. And that as we have conferences that deal with, um, you know, education within those domains that that we need to have a presence there and and collaborate with those entities to to move things uh, forward in terms of awareness and, and adoption of um, of all your and open education and capacity building in that area neil are there any more comments or questions um i i have a couple of quick inputs from lisa petridis um I, just a reminder to encourage everyone to feel free to actually speak their comments. I'm sure uh, the attendees are getting sick of hearing my voice by now. Um, but uh, so Lisa mentions just two additional resources that we can draw on. One is a reminder that UNESCO has uh, a hub curated by partner countries aligned to its ICT competency framework for teachers, um, which is intended to inform educational policymakers, providers of professional learning and working teachers on the role of ICT in educational reform, um, as well as to assist member states in developing national ICT competency standards for teachers with an ICT and education master plan approach. Um, so that is a resource that's available. And uh, she also mentions um, that in the public library OER Commons, the Alexa OER Hub promotes the use, development and sharing of OERs in the Arab region. Um, so again, we'll capture all of those. Uh, while I'm on those items, uh, we have uh, uh, an input from Ethel Valenzuela uh, from CIAMIO, which has developed and established the C SEA MOOCs network where online learning resources can be shared and OERs can be uploaded for certificate or for capacity building. This is a partnership um, between and among CIAMIO centers and open universities in Southeast Asia, as well as ministries of education. 
Is there any similar type of network in other regions that we can link to uh, or collaborate with for OER? Um, so, so that's really helpful inputs from all of you. We will capture them in the notes. Uh, and I think what's coming from this, plus the inputs we got from the survey, uh, Gihan, is we, we really have a good base already of a kind of catalog of resources that we can draw on. Yes, yes. So uh, I think that, that we, we'll make sure that that's all nicely captured in, in the meeting notes. Um, but back to you. And listen, so, please encourage people to put their hands up and speak. I'm sure, as I said, I'm sure you're all sick of me by now. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, the previous comment, I think it was by Lisa, no, no, or uh, Sila, I'm not sure anymore, but um, it was the comment of that the existence of a hub or the existence of a hub does not necessarily mean that it is uh, active and functioning. And so uh, that is another um uh, another area where we might uh, want to think and work is the idea of how does a hub uh, or a repository become dynamic, active and alive. Um, and I think that is partially, um, you know, this is an important area. So as we move along, it's not enough to have those, those hubs, but also to make them uh, dynamic, growing, organic and um, so that is something I've noticed from the, and I thought about when I heard her comment. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Neil? Yeah, I think we have an excellent base of, 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 uh, of organizations, of communities that work together, and we'll, uh, we'll go through these and see what we can, can make of that. With some of them, we can learn from their lessons of how they work across countries and how they interact with governments. Uh, and maybe we create other organizations similar to the last one mentioned in other regions if they do not exist. And again, uh, learn from their best practices on how to make these useful um, and effective in, in reaching our goals. That's great. So I just got one more um, and then I should move on. Um, yeah. This is from Tsuneo Yamada, who is from uh, Open University of Japan, who says, in Japan, we have no repository specialized in OER at the moment. The information must be extracted from general purpose repositories, for example, into universities' federated search system. But uh, he believes that we can, we can contribute also, uh, meaning uh, the Japanese education system, I'm assuming, which is great news, so we'll note that. And uh, I think with that, um, maybe, Gihan, we can move on to the next slide. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, so the next slide is on research, and I added to it the idea of knowledge creation. The details of a lot of input that we got on the survey implies that we do not only need research, but we need um, sharing of best practices the creation of new models uh, for collaboration, for exchange, for uh, even business models. Um, and so, so there's a lot of emphasis from the input we got on knowledge creation and on collaborative research. So um, there is a push for uh, research that uh, where grants favor research that is cross-national and cross-regional and cross-institutional. Uh, there seems to be a push for that and uh, uh, providing opportunities to engage in research and uh, knowledge creation. Uh, there was also uh, an input uh, from um, that was, I think, quite um, um, that adds a, an idea for capacity building that is slightly different is that in some parts of the world we also need capacity building in terms of uh, research and uh, knowledge creation. So some uh, in some regions of the world there might be OER but the idea of making or disseminating best practices um, the, the skills involved in that might be missing and that this is an area of capacity building that we need to focus on as well.
Great, thank so, you. Um, just uh, some quick updates from the Q&A section. In the meantime, uh, also for the benefit of translation purposes, Melinda, who is one of our chairs from yesterday, is noting that in the Philippines, we also have capacity building on the use, development, and sharing of OERs, especially for blended teaching and learning and in online learning. She supplies a link. Um, then we have Gemma Santos Hermosa, uh, who notes, as some of you already know from the Spanish Network of University Libraries, we're working in a translation into Spanish of the Ontario OER Toolkit, which will be available soon and have published a report about the situation of OER in the institutional repositories of higher education and some recommendations to improve them. Again, uh, these inputs really highlighting uh, what a wealth of knowledge there is in the community. Um, and then I think uh, we have a comment, I think if I've understood correctly from Christian Strucker, when he says already mentioned yesterday, um, is a resource he spoke about, a checklist for beginners in open online learning. So that's another resource. Um, as I say, I think we'll, we'll be able to get the, the launching space from, I'm responsible for the communication strategy for, uh, of the working groups for developing a plan. And I'm very excited because it looks like we have a ton of resources to put into uh, a portal as a starting point. Um, are there any specific comments that people would like to add to section D that, um, uh, that Gihan has just introduced for us? So this section emerged as very high, uh, a very high priority on our survey. Um, and so the idea is that we not, do not only want to um, build capacity regarding usage of OER or the creation or the curation of uh, um, OERs, but that it's, the time has come where we need to disseminate a lot of what we have learned and the models that we've used um, and to go in our research beyond what is the value of OER in simple terms, of course, there could be um, a lot more done in that area as well. Uh, but, uh, and that uh, all these efforts, these research efforts and knowledge creation efforts should ideally be collaborative. I have a hand now again from Nokulonga, uh, just down the road from me. So Nokulonga, you're unmuted again. Well, you're, you're able to talk, let's say. Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, I've just heard Melinda say uh, in, the, in Philippines, they have students who are engaged in open education resources. In our case, we are just starting and it would be great if we are linked with them and we can collaborate. And the good thing with the students I'm referring to is that they are postgraduate students who are also doing research. And therefore, it would be good uh, that we learn from each other so that at least we can uh, start um, uh, engaging them in um, much as we engage them in the, in the development of the resources, but we also engage them in research activities where they can investigate their, the, what they are developing and what is happening in other countries as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nokolonga. I have a, I'm sorry about this, Gihan, but it's my voice again. <laughs> are, <laughs> I don't mind, Neil. Uh, um, I'm going back to, first, a, a quick comment from Lisa Petridis on the collaboration issue. Uh, she says, it's important to note here that collaboration, as Gihan says, needs to be supported. Building active communities takes time, resources, and opportunities to actually work together. Too often collaboration is an afterthought and not a central part of, the, of strategies, policies, and implementation. And I think uh, Lisa's in a good position to comment on that, having run OER Commons, which focuses really heavily on uh, collaboration. So they've got lots of experience. We then have a comment um, from Rania Idris Mohammed again. From the point of equity to education, currently the focus on using online materials so it's how to reach and cover remote areas where they still have internet challenges. Uh, so she's talking there about the need for support printed materials about, that, that will raise awareness and using OER materials. I think they're highlighting the importance of making sure that this is not all just happening online, um, but, but also actually that uh, 
we're making sure that we consider the, the access and needs for people who uh, don't have internet access on a reliable basis. Ethel also points out that if applicable, it would be good to have an OER research agenda and some research grants that OER champion, champions can access. I think I agree with that totally. That is something we also did discuss in a separate working session. So I think that will be coming through very strongly. And then I have uh, a hand from Vanessa Proudman. So uh, Vanessa, I have opened you up to be able to talk. Thanks very much, Vanessa from uh, Spark Europe. So I'm just wondering, um, I had to pop out uh, during the session, so hopefully this hasn't already been brought up, but when you're gathering uh, the resources um, for capacity building um, and also want to carry out more research, I'm wondering whether we could also um, try to bring together um, all of our rich resources um, and then also to monitor that over time to be able to show the impact of our work and also the policies um, that we are implementing um, and so that we can really follow the growth um, and show the strength of um, OER over time. Thanks. Well, thank you, Vanessa. I think, uh, I think your point uh, is something that we've heard multiple times during the past uh, few days, the idea of monitoring the growth across the different areas uh, in OER. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, what uh, Rania Idris has said about equity. And uh, it, it is often the case that if online is going on very well, uh, that we forget those that are less privileged. We've witnessed that on a personal level in Egypt during the COVID crisis where our university having the infrastructure had a fantastic time moving online and trying um, and using the different resources we had. And so we had a very successful experience but we often forget that um, um, the majority for in our parts of the world are less privileged and for some people, um, uh, for some teachers that, uh, or teachers and learners who could not go online, their, their, their educational process completely stopped. Um, um, and, and so that is a very important point. It's an added challenge, but it's an important one because inclusiveness should be high on our agenda. And it is one of the, the great things about OER is reaching the less privileged and reaching everyone actually. And, um, and so I think that is an added challenge, not only finding these materials, but making them available uh, again to those who uh, lack the infrastructure. Um, and not only the infrastructure, but again, here is an area of capacity building uh, is how people um, that people not only um, lack the, the, the technological infrastructure, but there is so much that needs to be done uh, in terms of capacity building, uh, things that we do not really think about. Um, so um, thank you, Rania, for that very important point that we do not lose focus of that. Um, so in terms of research, it seems to me that uh, we kind of have a whole uh, uh, area here where we need to grow in terms of having a research agenda that was mentioned over the past few days, um, cap building capacity so that people can engage in that agenda and, uh, and empowering those who might lack the skills of writing the best proposal or lack the skills of doing that research or creating that knowledge. Um, but um, so having enough support, whether it's financial or other forms of support for different members of the OER community to engage in research, uh, monitoring what this research is doing in terms of uh, establishing OERs and um, in scaling uh, the impact. Um, so there, there seems to be um, a lot that can be done in that area. And, uh, from the comments we got, um, it is a high priority for everyone who answered our survey. So we then uh, have a, a further input just building on that, uh, Gihan and, and everyone from Suspeta Gatobu again uh, in Kenya. 
what would communities of practice include? Uh, do we need a mechanism to identify communities of practice and encourage their creation? Um, very good questions. Uh, Robert uh, replies, for me, these are communities of teachers and learners around a knowledge domain where they can discuss about their profession. That includes OER with the O in brackets. So I think he's saying not just OER, but other resources as well, but is not solely about OER. So I think his key point there is that communities of practice wouldn't necessarily focus only on OER issues, but a much wider range of teaching and learning issues of which OER would be one. Uh, and I think certainly if we're taking the knowledge domain approach, it would be uh, probably restrictive if we try to limit it to just discussions about OER. I think that's a good point. Um, I do have also a couple of other inputs. Robert gave a shameless plug for a lot of resources he's collected on his website. We'll share that link. And Christian has shared a couple more resources which we'll put in the meeting notes. Um, then we hope, uh, then, then Ethel has added, we hope that UNESCO can come up with a directory of experts or providers of OER that developing countries and many interested in OERs can access or consult with. Um, so that's another consideration, I think, for the communications aspect of the dynamic coalition and how uh, some kind of online facility can help to network and collect information on who's doing what. It obviously connects to the OER world map that we heard about um, earlier today and in previous sessions as well, which already seeks to do quite a lot of that. So I think we don't have to reinvent that wheel, but rather draw on resources that are already um, out there uh, that we can connect you through the dynamic coalition. So that's it from my side, uh, Gihon. I, I, in the okay. absence of anything else, should I move on to the next slide? Uh, I, think, I think the next slide is, is more about resources. So um, I think if there are no more comments or questions, we might wrap up by saying that we are blessed with the dilemma of our times of having too many resources and too many possibilities and learning how we can make sense of all that uh, and put it in a format that allows others to make full use of it. Um, so uh, I think we have a lot, a lot we to start with. We definitely do not have a problem with that concern. Um, but it is the idea of uh, maybe uh, not the existence of one community of practice, but the existence of multiple networks that overlap at certain points where they can help each other, and you know have their own communities in areas where um they need to focus on their um, uniqueness um i think um if there are no more questions or comments um i'll wrap i'll wrap it up and i don't know if zainab or or neil or anybody has additional comments or areas that they would like to explore i leave it up to them at this point so just uh, from my side, um, I think maybe oh, before we head back to Zenit, uh, that's all the comments from my side. I think uh, today uh, we've had a very active Q&A session compared to previous sessions. So that's been really rich and beneficial. Uh, we've captured all of those inputs and um, then I've been through everything else. So uh, Zenit, maybe I'll hand back to you um, to close things up. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil um, and Jihan. Thank you for your presentation, Jihan. It was very, very instructive. Um, I'd just like to bring in to the conversation that, as Neil said, we had a very rich conversation. I'm just looking at the questions responses. We had over uh, 54, 55 uh, responses to the question uh, issues raised, and now it's getting more and more. Um, so we have really gone through many issues. One thing I want to bring up is that we have, we seem to be going around a couple of main ideas. The first one being that there is, a, there are a lot of resources out there. The second one being that there is a movement towards getting resources in different languages. And the, uh, and there have been already initiatives that are started. And I think that's going to be a very good start to the next topic that Jihan will be introducing, which is about the electronic tool. And the third point I want to bring in is the intersection between this activity, uh, this working group, and other working groups that have to do with accessibility and multilingualism in particular, but also the 
two working groups. I think it's important that we are able to focus on one subject clearly, but it's also important to realize that it has dimensions that are intersecting. And the issue of multilingualism seems to come up over and over and over again. So I think we're gonna to have to find a way of addressing this. And I think what's really interesting in the discussion is that we've talked about languages which have a very large number of speakers, but which are not usually in the discussion because they're not languages that are used in, in Europe and North America. And I think it's really important. The discussion on Swahili and, and Hausa and Yoruba is really quite important because there is an enormous amount of speakers of these languages. And it's important that the, doc, the, the tools are available in, in a multilingual format. So I'd really like to thank you, Jihan, and thank everyone for your very valuable inputs. And I think we've made this discussion much more, much richer, and we've really been able to identify how diverse this field really is and how many actors and part champions there are worldwide in all regions. And I think this is really great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for this uh, great uh, discussion. Zena, is there something else that you would like me to talk about? Were you going to address the, um, the, the tool? Uh, the, yeah. the OER? Yeah, uh, my sense there, Zenep, is that we've covered that quite comprehensively in previous sessions and even in the inputs today in terms of links to various resources and tools that okay. exist. Um, so I, I suspect that's now sufficiently covered through all the working groups. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I would gladly talk about it, but as Neil said, we've mentioned it several times today and uh, during other sessions um, and um, it, it basically alludes to uh, the ICT CFT hub for UNESCO where we are combining um, the capacity building uh, efforts of, um, of different countries that have worked under the support and sponsorship of UNESCO to create materials for teachers. They exist in three or four languages, Arabic, English, French, I think Portuguese, and maybe one or two, and uh, Spanish, maybe, I'm not sure. But um, most of these countries are either um, from Africa, uh, Asia, or the Caribbean. And um, um, the, personally, as uh, with our efforts, having this hub has been extremely useful uh, in having a great head start um, rather than reinventing the wheel and then adapting it to our local context. Um, so I think that might be enough for now to talk about it. Um, we can definitely talk about it more elaborately at a particular point in the future where we work on collaboration and exchange of knowledge in that area. Is that okay, Zainab? Is there a particular point that you wanted me to focus on? Um, I was actually referring to the uh, to the electronic tool that we had been we had uh, foreseen to develop for the uh, for all the activities. And so I think oh. one of the points that came up throughout this discussion is that there are a great number of sites already existing that have uh, OER capacity building materials available in different languages and in different fields. So from what I would understand, if one of the tasks of this electronic tool would be to have a place where it would be able to have a, a view of everything that's existing already and to be able to also have contacts within the communities that are working in these different uh, different OER capacity building tools. So um, I think we have had a very good experience with the tool that we developed for the um, for the ICT CFT, ICT Competency Framework for Teachers, which you mentioned, Jihan, and which is really a very good best practice example. And I think a number of this people in this discussion are members of this tool. And one of the things that we found, uh, and, and I think others here, I think a good third of the participants are part of that tool. And it's done through uh, ISKME and uh, 
Lisa Patridis, um, this tool is really useful for sharing resources, but it's also useful for creating a community dialogue. So in this regard, I think what we could understand is that these electronic tools, they, they're very good for sharing the information, of course, but they're also very good for setting up this collab these collaborative mechanisms. If I may throw out, we just have a little bit of time, so if I could throw out one question to this group, because a lot of you are, have already worked with one collaborative tool, which is the ICT-CFT platform. One thing we found is that we have an, a conjoined uh, WhatsApp group to it, which uh, many of you are part of for this tool and for the work on this area. And we found that it's very good for, um, for sharing information and for just creating a sense of community. Would other people in the group have any ideas of um, tools or mechanisms that would bring, that would support collaboration between the members of the people who are sharing information? I would just put the question out. No, I mean, I, I mean, Zainab, if I may comment, I think the wonderful thing about WhatsApp is that it's so, um, it's it's exactly the idea of a of a community that is focused on a particular area that overlaps with other areas, but it, it is focused on on ICT CFT, and we are members of different groups uh, that 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 overlap with other communities. And I think the powerful thing is that it's on our phones. Uh, it's part of our lives. We don't have to go anywhere to interact with it. Most phones have access to WhatsApp. Uh, so it is, it, is, it is friendly in, a sense, in multiple ways. And, and that is something to consider that um, we need tools that are friendly and easy and accessible. Uh, to to almost everyone, so in a sense they are inclusive, um, and so that is something to to learn from that. I it just comes to my phone. I don't have to go anywhere, and so it's part of my life. Even though I'm someone who's not stuck to the phone, but it's there, and and the dynamic aspect of it makes you constantly engaged. It it makes engagement easier. It might not necessarily facilitate all forms of engagement but the community is, is there, it's alive for you. Uh, and so I think that is an important thing to remember. I do want to talk about, um, just mention that I was really inspired by the idea of uh, the map, the global map that was mentioned by a colleague from, from South America. It's the idea that we could start with that and map what is there and then think of what layers do we want to add to such a map um, to make it uh, more useful in terms of contextualization, communities. Uh, so I think we have certain places and best practice communities that we can start working with and seeing what features make these more accessible and inclusive um, for a wider variety of people, especially that uh, I don't remember who made that point, but the idea that um, that the situation for other parts of the world that are not Europe and North America um, might be very different um, in terms of the features that would make it successful in other parts of the world and more user friendly and would allow people to engage um, uh, in that community. Something that, that, that uh, I would like to mention is that our WhatsApp group is a group where some people, you know, contribute in English, some in French, some in Arabic, and somehow it always works. So, um, <laughs> so that is very promising. So thank you, Zainab, for pointing that out. And, um, and it's, it's very exciting to see everything that we found out and that we can do. Seems that we have our plates full with a lot of exciting things and projects to move forward. And with that, I, I leave the last word for you. I can maybe just very quickly uh, add that there's no hands showing at this stage, but 
there is some chat going on about the pros and cons of uh, different platforms for our consideration when it comes to the dynamic coalition. Um, so Wayne McIntosh down in New Zealand there uh, indicates I'd strongly recommend that the dynamic coalition adopt an open first policy when selecting tools for communication to ensure inclusivity. Education should avoid tools provided by corporate entities. Uh, so both Fabio and Christian have plus one that um, uh, observation. Um, and uh, there's then also Lisa's mentioned WhatsApp and Slack. We, when we've spoken about WhatsApp, she mentioned Slack as well. Uh, and both Wayne and, and Christian have um, just highlighted some of the risks of using proprietary platforms. So I think these are obviously important considerations for us to consider. Um, I will take those into account in a draft communication strategy, which will flow from this. And obviously, as with all of those processes, that will be shared with the members of the community for their comments. Um, so, and, and their, their feedback before it's all finalized. I do think that what's highlighted through this uh, is that, that we also going to need to differentiate between the communication platforms that will be the kind of official ones, if you like, of the dynamic coalition, and then the various activities that are taking place down at other more regional, national, domain specific areas. Uh, and, and obviously, um, we'll need to think carefully about uh, what UNESCO is harnessing for the, the, per the official purposes, if you like, of the dynamic coalition. Um, and then obviously, uh, as a networking initiative, it will be up to the, those regional initiatives and, and other initiatives to also make their own decisions about what they want to use, rather than us seeing the dynamic coalition as trying to impose um, uh, from the center. But I think the, the, there have been some very good inputs there, which we'll take into account as we put the plan together. So I think that that's all I've got um, from the community so far, uh, Zenep. Um, yes, thank you, Neil. Thanks very much. Yes, indeed, we, we are trying very hard to uh, make everyone happy and, and make sure that everybody can access the information, have the information and be able to use it easily and you know, do it in a manner which is coherent. So, as Neil said, we have to look at tools which are for communication, which are uh, for exchange and for sharing of information. Uh, in terms of sites. So we're going to take into account the comments and uh, I think we have to stay pragmatic and work towards an ideal, but we have to be able to function because this is a global community and we're working in many regions, uh, in all regions, and we're working with everyone. And that means it's everyone who has uh, access, not everyone has the same access to the internet and not everyone has the same amount of uh, digital skills necessary in order to configure tools which are not easily available so we do have to have our ideals but we do have to be pragmatic so um but we thank you very much for um for all of your comments and I would uh, like to thank Jihan for this very, very constructive discussion and all of the participants who, and all of you have intervened. Um, and we will be having our closing session this afternoon at four o'clock CET. And I look forward to seeing you all there. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Neil, you. Do you want to add anything, Jihan? No, just to thank everybody for their contributions. This has been uh, really um, very rich and um, and it's both uh, exhilarating and intimidating in its scope, uh, but uh, that is what makes life interesting. So um, thank you very much for being part of this and looking forward to our next steps. Right, bye everyone. See you later on today for the closing session. Yep. Till then, bye.